Okay, good morning. We will begin this session. So this is a session on implementing problem-oriented policing. Uh, we haven't got, in an hour and a half, time to cover all of the issues associated with implementing problem-oriented policing. If you're desperately interested in all those issues, Stuart Kirby and I have written a publication listing 60-some or uh, different issues that must be attended to in thinking about the full implementation of problem-oriented policing. But in this session, we have a, uh, a variety of ways of thinking about it. Um, the first presentation is really not so much about direct implementation as a fresh thinking about the way in which police think about their authority and what kind of authority they rely on to get their, the job done. And the second presentation will be really a more holistic uh, discussion of the implementation of problem-oriented policing in a major police agency. And the third presentation will really focus on one aspect of implementation relating to the training of police officers in the concept. So the first presentation will be by Nancy Levine, who is the director of the uh, Crime Policy Center at the Urban Institute, one of the major non-governmental non think tanks in the United States. Nancy. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, really delighted to honor Herman Goldstein uh, on this panel and through this presentation. So you'll see me referencing his work throughout. Um, but the title of my presentation is on the police use of regulatory authority in problem-oriented policing. And what I'll be doing is first making the case for why regulatory measures are an important tool in problem solving, and then describe this framework that I came up with on um, the components of effective regulatory measures in the context of policing. I'm also gonna spend most of my time talking about a case study from Houston, Texas, on their efforts to apply POP in uh, preventing or reducing convenience store crime, and then we'll talk about implications. So first of all, why regulatory measures? Well, um, those of you who may be new to problem-oriented policing may not r realize, and I, I had to be reminded of it, that it was actually a component of Herman Goldstein's seminal 1979 article on problem solving. Um, in that article, he argued that at the time, and even arguably today, a lot of policing is focused on uh, process rather than outcomes. He called it um, means-based versus ends-based. And what he argued for is that policing that's focused on ends or outcomes, that is crime reduction, is really the way to go. And you'll see I pasted um, a, a component of the article in there where he talks specifically on the role that police have in um, coordinating with regulations and ordinances to address the actual ends or crimes. Um, so why regulatory measures? Well, um, if you focus on outcomes, you're focusing on the underlying causes of crimes, you're developing solutions that are related to those causes. Um, Whereas with process-focused policing, and there's a lot of different ways to define process, from focusing on response time to like different kinds of efficiencies, um, it can yield a lot of negative impacts. So take, for example, in New York City in the late 90s and early 2000s, the, the process of increasing stop and frisk. Um, that led to um, biased policing, racially biased outcomes, it fed mass incarceration, and it led to low community trust, where the police didn't trust the police, they didn't want to engage in partnerships, and that um, really affected the ability to engage in crime control and prevention. So definitely, you need to focus more on the outcomes, the crimes, and the, and the problem solving. But the problem that police face is that they're shouldering all of society's ills, right? I mean, that um, they're the front line for all the things that are ailing society and alien individuals. May it be mental health issues, um, you know, grievances, domestic violence, it all falls on their shoulders, and yet they don't have the resources and they shouldn't be um, required to solve all those problems by themselves. So the solution is for the police to use their authority um, to enlist other state actors, agencies, um, entities, stakeholders, and apply regulatory measures to incentivize compliance and crime prevention. So, I uh, had the opportunity to write the concluding policy implications chapter for a forthcoming edited volume by Graham Newman and Josh Freilich, and it's on regulatory measures in 
all manner of criminal justice crime prevention. Um, so there's a chapter on cyber crime, there's a chapter on environmental crime, on labor trafficking, on problem word of policing, which authored by uh, Mike Scott here, very, very good uh, chapter. So I would encourage you to read it when it goes to print. Um, but my task was to sift through all of these chapters and kind of come up with some key findings. And I developed this framework called Agile, it, it will go to print, and then at the end of this presentation, we'll talk about maybe why it shouldn't. Um, but that's done. Um, so I was trying to come up with an acronym that would um, kind of flag different characteristics of what makes for effective regulatory measures. So the measures need to be adaptable to the specific type of crime that you're addressing. This is consistent with uh, crime specificity and situational crime prevention, right? You need to know what you're trying to regulate around. It needs to be germane uh, to the actors, the stakeholders, but also germane to the local context, the geographic context. Um, it needs to be incentive-based. You need to find ways to cajole and persuade uh, compliance with the regulation. And it has to be legitimate. Um, it has to be valid in the eyes of the people that are in both enforcing the regulation and um, need to comply with it. Um, and of course, and this is the researcher in me, it needs to be evaluated both uh, ongoing through, through an assessment phase as well as after the fact. It needs to be evaluated not just for whether it's achieving its intended impact, but also bearing in mind some unintended impacts and also looking at things like cost-benefit analysis. So that's Agile, and I'll come back to it later. But now I really want to focus my time on the case study of um, convenience store crimes in Houston, Texas. So in 2007, convenience store crimes, and particularly violent crimes, uh, aggravated assaults, robberies, and homicides, were at a, an all-time high in the city. Um, roughly 1,100 robberies, 400 aggravated assaults, and 10 homicides had occurred on um, convenience store properties in that year alone. Um, owners were up in arms, staff were fearful, uh, there, people weren't wanting to um, you know, patronize the stores, police were tired of responding to calls repeatedly. It's the standard kind of scenario around a problem that demands problem solving as a response. Um, so in terms of analysis, one of the first things they did was establish a convenience store task force. And this was established by the mayor. It was a jurisdiction-wide task force. They had all the right people at the table, of course, the police department, but also the greater retail, uh, Houston Retailers Association, so getting their buy-in, um, the individual stores, of course, um, and, and, and interestingly, the petroleum companies, con because convenience stores tend to have gas pumps, so they had a vested interest as well. And then the second step was to define convenience store. This was important because they had to know what retailers they were trying to get to change their behaviors. Um, so they had to define what they meant by that, and then they had to go and catalog all the convenience stores across the city to make sure they had a full listing of the stores. And then they did the problem, the typical analysis of the problem. So they looked at the distribution of crimes by type across the store, by geography, by time of day, uh, day of week, um, to the, the, the degree that they had the data available, they did look at some offending behavior patterns as well. Um, they found what we usually find, that a small share of stores were responsible for a large share of the convenience store crimes. And then they looked at the evidence, the best practice, the research base on convenience store crime prevention. And um, the, importantly, they sought input from store owners. So this is a, an important part of the legitimacy of the regulation, is that they, they really sought store owner input on the problems they were facing and what they perceived to be the challenges in implementing crime prevention. So there was a perception that it would be expensive to implement crime prevention strategies. Um, they, there were some issues around some stores being, uh, owners being not, um, you know, English wasn't their first language, there were some cultural issues. There was a lot of context that um, they had to learn from talking to store owners. So what was the response? Um, the response, importantly, was developed in partnership with the store owners, and those partnerships are a critical component of the, stop, the response. But the response itself was an ordinance, a city ordinance that was, that was passed. It had eight components. Um, and um, the first one was that stores had to register as convenience stores. Uh, and it was free to register, but very important that they registered. And when they registered, they'd receive a packet of crime prevention um, tools, strategies, measures that they had to engage in or implement. Um, this wasn't done in a vacuum. Officers were there to help them along the way. Um, there were um, 
there was uh, mandatory training on things like handling cash and making sure that you didn't have so much cash on hand that you would be, um, you know, a very rewarding place to rob, um, uh, drop boxes uh, to put the cash in for the same reason, um, how to respond to a robbery so that it doesn't escalate into further violence. Um, uh, they were encouraged to sign trespass affidavits to enable police to enforce trespassing on the premises because there was a lot of loitering and crime happening um, in the surrounding area and on the property of the stores. Um, things like making sure windows are unobstructed so that people could see what was happening, including patrol cars driving by. Um, uh, installing a silent alarm button and installing surveillance cameras. Um, the, the result of not complying with this ordinance was a fine of $500, and those stores that were per persistently non-compliant could be subject to adjudication. But the main component of this intervention was really more about educating um, the stores, the retailers, on um, com uh, compliance with the measures, like why it's in their vested interest to do this. So in terms of assessment, what they found was that crimes of all types declined dramatically. I'll show you a graph in a moment. Um, there was very, very high levels of store compliance, which uh, spoke to the value of bringing them in at the beginning. Um, the owners uh, reported feeling safer. Um, the officers felt like it was uh, an effective intervention. There was some anecdotal evidence of displacement. I think that, um, you know, perhaps a little bit troubling, uh, but also underscored that it was certainly working where it was intended to in the convenience stores. Um, and then for those stores that weren't compliant, officers went back and tried to persuade, cajole, educate. Um, there were some citations issued to persistently non-compliant stores. Um, and here's the outcome. And I think you see um, what Ron referenced yesterday as the cliff edge drop here. Um, because even though the initiative started in 2007, uh, the ordinance didn't pass until 2009. And so you see a real dramatic decline in all types of crimes, um, both um, violent crimes and others. So that's all good, but, and it's, it's really pretty consistent with this Agile acronym that I came up with um, because they focus specifically on convenience stores and convenience store crimes and developing the response, although they weren't specifically crime focused. So they, um, some of the measures were around robberies, but they were also intending to address other types of crimes. It was certainly germane in that it was tailored to the stores themselves and the interests of the retail associations and petroleum companies. Uh, and it did uh, involve incentives because of the training and the education component, trying to appeal to the interests of the businesses. Um, the task force uh, led to the legitimacy of the ordinance. And um, it was indeed evaluated, but I'd say evaluated with a small e, more assessed than evaluated rigorously. Um, so it, they looked at um, the impact on crime and on displacement. Um, they didn't look at costs or benefits or didn't really focus too much on unintended impacts. So let's revisit this, though. Um, what happened today? So I had occasion to reach back out to the officer, uh, Ryan Watson, who's now been promoted to sergeant, find out what's been happening since uh, this case study was presented at the POP conference in 2000. 13, let's just say that. Uh, and, um, you know, what, what's changed? Has there been slippage? And so on and so forth. So just to remind you, this is what you saw just a few minutes ago. And this is what it looks like today. Perhaps not surprising, this happens with a lot of POP projects. You see the slippage and an uptick back again. Um, so what went wrong? Um, what I learned from Sergeant Watson is that there was a fair amount of implementation fatigue. It was a lot to ask officers to go and make sure stores were compliant. There's something like a thousand registered convenience stores in Houston, Texas. And he also said that they got easily distracted by what he called new shiny programs, other things, other uh, crime du jour, um, uh, other uh, interventions that were perhaps a little bit more interesting to your average police officer. Of course, um, 
the two key champions, uh, one retired quite recently and then uh, the other was promoted and moved on to other responsibilities. So he wasn't there to kind of maintain that fidelity in the implementation. And so overall, it really lacked sustainability. Um, but I would also argue that it was missing a strong enforcement component, and that might have been a, another part of the problem. So if you look at um, this uh, escalated response model that uh, Mike Scott and Herman Goldstein uh, published in 2005 in a guidebook titled, I can't remember, Shifting and sharing responsibility for public safety problems. problems. A must read. Uh, but I, I really like this um, escalation because I think it, it helps, it gives you a lot of different tools. And I think you, what you want to do is always focus on the least invasive, a more kind of persuasion cajoling method first, and then build up to the more um, enforcement focused methods. Um, but I would argue that the, the Houston convenience store case study didn't really go full to enforcement for some of the, the stores that were really persistently not complying. So there's, there's other things that could have been done, and also in conversations with Karen Schmerler, she said, well, also, Nancy, consider the fact that really what this ordinance was enforcing was the inputs rather than the outputs. So it enforced engagement in crime prevention efforts rather than enforcing um, stores that were above average in terms of persistent calls for service and large volumes of calls and crimes. And so perhaps uh, flipping that model might have had a bigger and longer lasting impact. And two examples are the, the Chula Vista Motel uh, case study that most of you are aware of because it's so uh, famous and, and impactful. It's a great case study. And then I'm thinking of the um, John and Emily X article on applying the environmental concept of cap and trade, which is also um, represented in the Chula Vista model. So essentially, you know, what is a threshold by which crime is too high and you have to put the cost of that back onto the business? These are some things that might have changed. Also, just requiring more ongoing education and, and codifying that in some way to ensure that sustainability, um, adjudicating a, in, in a way that I don't think happened. Um, and of course, the change in leadership is hard to control, but that's something to keep an eye on. So then I come to the end of the story and I say, hmm, maybe I should revise my acronym of Agile and say that the last E should be enforcement instead of evaluation. I don't know, the researcher in me is a little conflicted. I believe strongly in evaluation. Um, and also I fear that enforcement might get misconstrued as the kind of enforcement that really is more process oriented than, than ends oriented. But we can talk about that perhaps later. Thank you. Okay, so the second presentation here will be uh, from the Durham Constabulary and about the Durham Constabulary in the United Kingdom. It will be presented by Chief Constable Mike Barton and Sylvia Chenery, uh, a world-renowned and world-traveled uh, crime consultant and expert in problem-oriented policing, who's also done a lot of training in problem-oriented policing in Bermuda. Okay. Um, good morning, everybody. Stuart, we've got more than 10. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, I know. Uh, horrible picture, but um, <coughs> sorry about this. Got to get some sort of introduction. Mike sorry, is... are you talking about mine? <laughs> <laughs> Sylvia's allowed me to come and speak about the organisation <laughs> I run. Thank you, Sylvia. <laughs> So as you know, uh, Mike is the Chief of Police and uh, myself, I was a researcher for a number of years, I used to, to manage a research unit and um, went to the dark side uh, about 13 years ago and uh, as a consultant, but for the last 10 years or so, I seem to have gone down specifically just down this pop route and I am a disciple of Goldstein, and I'm out there to spread the word where, wherever I can take it. And so um, that's a little about me. And I'm Police Chief of Durham, and uh, we'll go straight into... This is uh, what we've been asked to do. 
Um, I'll let you read that for a moment. Um, and uh, that's how we've balanced our presentation. The, the way we decided to do it is a bit knockabout. And it, it, uh, we haven't practiced this because I think spontaneity <laughs> should, should come out. Um, but Sylvia's going to describe what we look like from outside. And I'm going to try and describe to you what we aim to look like and how we've shaped what we are. I think too often in policing, we think we're doing a great job and it's only when you actually ask the public and, and they give you sometimes uh, messages that you don't want to hear. So I will hear things from Sylvia today that I don't particularly appreciate, but you can't deny their veracity because it's what Sylvia thinks. I think what the, and, and the difference with this particular presentation is because we've heard lots about how, you know, there are projects uh, uh, and uh, that, have, uh, that have used the POP approach, but this is about how do you actually implement it organisationally, which has very different needs, very different demands, and something that hopefully is long, is long lasting. That's the thing we're looking for. So this is a complicated slide, but it's actually, uh, you can go to this. So this is a Magister's Inspectorate of Constabulary. It's now of the F uh, Fire and Rescue Services. So it's HMIC FRS. But if you go there, you can see all of the inspections of Durham and all the other 43 forces in England and Wales. And this is the Peel process, uh, a reference to Lord Peel, who founded the police, the Metropolitan Police in 1829. So it's the police effectiveness, efficiency, and legitimacy. So we're measured across 14 things. And this is drawn from uh, HMIC report, I think three years ago, two or three years ago. Uh, where we were the, uh, we accumulated um, a, a raft of outstanding gradings within Durham. I've got to say, this happened in 2015. In 2015, we'd been inspected for a couple of years and we'd been damned with faint praise. We'd got, we'd got pretty much goods across the board, but I was getting really frustrated that I knew that some of my people were doing world class stuff and it wasn't being uh, identified so that summer the summer of 2015 i remember it well i spoke to all of uh, my significant leaders in the organization there's about there used to be over 3,000 people in my organization now because of cuts we're just shy of 2,500 and i got all the leaders in a room and i told them that hmic were an irrelevance uh, they hadn't to worry about hmic uh, we just had to focus on what we were doing and then the Daily Telegraph published this map, um, uh, singling us out as the only outstanding force. So I had a Damascene moment, and I got hastily got all my senior staff in, and I told them that HMIC weren't quite the irrelevance that I'd seen they were uh, <laughs> the week before. Um, and, but I think partly the reason why we were seen uh, as outstanding and have continued to be, so this is not a, this is not a blip, uh, just this year, and you can go and research it, we're still the only outstandingly effective police force in the UK. There are two outstanding at effectiveness, uh, uh, efficiency, that's Thames Valley and ourselves. But consistently throughout that, uh, over three years now, we've been rated outstanding. And I think the reason is that we don't care whether we're inspected or not. Um, I do not want the drumbeat, we'll talk about the drumbeat of the organisation later on, to actually miss a beat just because HMIC are in. And just to talk about the, uh, the uh, regulatory burden, for we are fully inspected by a team of sometimes up to 15 people for 13 weeks a year. 13 weeks a year we are inspected on, uh, we, Stuart was talking about vulnerability earlier. But what is interesting, what this has done to, to the force is that it actually has put a spotlight on them. So what we've now got, if we've got sort of officers uh, coming from all around the country, having wanting to look at what is it that Durham are doing, and the only, you know, they're wanting to lift and fit, you know, and what they've got to do is to understand what is it that has made it work. And there are so many different factors that have made it the outstanding force. Uh, and Mike will talk, we'll talk about those. In the next slide. 
Not this one. I'll talk about it. Yeah, uh, no, no, but uh, I'm just showing you that it's spontaneous and we really don't know what we're talking about. For me, so, um, do, you, do you want to do this one? Yeah, I do, actually. No, you're right. You, 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 this one, that was a really good segue into this slide. It was me that was wrong. So pop has to be driven from the top. So Lancashire, Michael speculated earlier whether or not Lancashire were actually at the cutting edge of problem-oriented policing and they're not. And it's because it hasn't been driven from the top. Um, and I think the other thing that's got to happen at the top is you've got to honour your predecessors. Far too often I see police leaders, any leaders, um, um, uh, be disrespectful to their predecessors. And some of them do, do it as a, as a counterpoint, a comparison, you know, I'm great, they weren't. Uh, I think all police leaders should honour all of their predecessors because all of them will have done great things may not appreciate everything they did, but keep quiet about that and silently change it. Because if you don't, then you will be consigned to history by your successor. And I always think that you should uh, type five leaders. Collins, from good to great, talks about type four and type five leadership. Type five leadership is where you grow the leadership for tomorrow. They, uh, just to give you a bit of an insight on my previous leaders, they were George... Paul and John, and they couldn't find a Ringo, so they employed me. Um, but it, it's really important that you honour your predecessors. It, you've got to be consistent. People have got to be made accountable. And we talked about enforcement. I think implementation, but I know it doesn't work for Agile, but ag Agile. But anyway, implementation, I think... Agile. Sorry? There is an I in Agile. Yeah, but I was thinking about it's enforcement. About yeah, moving yeah. the enforcement thing. <laughs> so, and... You've got to recognise talents and skills. Sometimes people say you only ask people to do problem-oriented policing if they've got that talent, those skills, they work in neighbourhood policing. Albeit they should be your champions and they should be people at the cutting edge. Everybody, and we'll talk later, everybody should be involved in it. Okay. Um, what they have invested in, as I've been working with Durham over the, the last couple of years or so, or longer probably, um, is that they've invested... She's been putting invoices in for five years. <laughs> 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 they've invested heavily in, in people, whether it's their own staff, their police staff, their, their police uh, officers, their communities. Um, uh, we have crime commissioners, of which actually uh, Mike is very involved with. He's one of the few forces where they've got a really quite close relationship, which is good because they control the money. Um, but as you can see here, working with communities, a great emphasis on working with communities and your local partners. The picture here of Mike actually getting out and about. That's a local chip shop. If you've ever been to English and our English cuisine does go beyond fish and chips, but everyone has to try the chips at least once. And, you know, sort of getting out and talking to people. He still, he still will do that. Pubs and chip shops now know that if they have a problem and they let me know about it, I make a personal visit. <laughs> <laughs> um, so these are the values. So I, I've just contrasted these with Herman. See if you press it again. So Herman and the team yesterday, I thought that was a really insightful uh, conversation. Gloria was there. And what Herman talked about in terms of the values of policing was minimum of coercion, prevention and pop. And I've put investigation and re uh, reducing reoffending there. He didn't actually say those words, but those were what I drew from him. And those, all those four values on the right-hand side are absolutely crucial to Durham, but they are not our published values. So our published values are the ones on the left. And the two that I want to point out to you are, are critical, are positive and courageous. You have got to rid your organisation of cynics. And that's what we do. So we sack cynics. We uh, invite people who are cynics to leave. Somebody once told me that... Uh, I, I, one of our questions... I, I do all the promotion boards. And one of our presentation questions is, how do you create a cynic-free organisation? Uh, and humour is an important part of our organisation. So somebody who said, you'll never do it, uh, you'll never achieve that, uh, was given top marks for humour, but uh, little for the answer. But what's crucial about positive is we should all have an optimistic mindset. And if you haven't, you should be invited to leave. And it's as simple as that. 
Now, you can't sack people like that, but you can invite them to leave. And courageous is all about being morally courageous as well as being physical. Minimum of coercion. Can I just give you a little uh, anecdote? So my officers at the moment and my police federation, the union, have gone out to the public vote because they want spit guards. Because we have recorded between 40 and 50 really serious spitting incidents at police officers and some people who were HIV positive spit as a, as a, to weaponise it. And all my officers want spit guards, and I'm, I'm not allowing them to have spit guards because I gave them body-worn video several years ago, and not all of them turn them on when they're facing violent people. Now, I think turning on a body-worn video is slightly less coercive than applying a spit mask, a spit mask to somebody. So once I'm... And I've told them this that once I get 100% use of body-worn video, so all of those spitting incidents are recorded on video, I'll give them spit guards, but not before. I think Alex Vitale's book, uh, The End of Policing, I think Malcolm Sparrow's book, Handcuffed, point to that really serious problem you've got if you focus on enforcement. Okay. The next thing is I've noted is, is about actually there is that feeling within the force that it, you're all part of a team, whether or not you, you know, you're an administrator or you're actually in the top office at the top of the building, uh, you're all part of it. And there is a different feel to it. Um, as you go into the police headquarters, the lift is um, a TARDIS. Now, some of you may not know what a TARDIS is, but if anyone has ever, ever watched a famous English TV programme called Doctor Who, Doctor Who travels through time in a time machine called a TARDIS, and the lift is a TARDIS. So that's what you actually go in. So that feel is there right from the start about actually this is a place you're welcome, and not a lot of police headquarters have that feel. Um, this drives me up the pole that, that everybody knows how you should be a leader because you've, we've, in British policing, we've started at the bottom and we've had plenty of time to look at police leadership. But it's fascinating when people get there, they make the same mistakes and reinvent a few of their own. Uh, um, and so... All of those things, strategies, structures, policies, plans, risk aversion and, and conformity, no, stop it. Um, particularly policies. Whenever anything goes wrong, people start to write a policy and they give it to the single issue zealot who's passionate about this thing. So they write this passionate policy of about 33 pages and of course you've then completely hamstrung the organisation. Because policy is what you do, not what you aspire to do. So if I have a serious incident in my organisation, I ask for the policies, and then we have a ritual burning of them. We burn all the policies. And they are replaced with these words. So we do replace them with a policy, but it's these words. In any given circumstance, do the right thing regardless of the consequences. That's our policy in that area now. Because if it isn't, you don't actually deal with what people are faced with. You then try and remember the 32 pages that might not even have read, and then you're held to account for those 32 pages when it goes wrong. In terms of the right-hand side, this is exactly where police leadership should be. So instead of policies, let's have knowledge. Instead of strategies, let's have culture. And stop restructuring the damn thing. Focus on the people. And I'll talk about recruitment a bit later on. Okay. Uh, and one of the things about instilling, instilling this passion is that he involves people. Uh, and, and the leadership team involves people. Uh, this is one example of actually involving young pe people, children. They have a mini police force within Durham. The children are given uniforms, they come into headquarters for training sessions, the schools get involved with it, and one of the uh, times I was there speaking to one of the teachers at one of the schools where they had a mini police force, they found that the spin-off effects were that actually the kids were going home and talking to their, 
their brothers and sisters and their parents about what they should and shouldn't be doing. There was less vandalism. They used to have, in one of the areas, uh, they used to have sort of public uh, park areas with flowers and they used to frequently get vandalized. Since the mini police are there, the, kid, the flowers don't get vandalized anymore. Parents parking outside school, big problem in the UK. One of the things they don't have is that actually in the schools where many police are there, they don't have as many problems because the children monitor it and guard it themselves. So it, it's not all soft and fluffy. It's not all pink and fluffy. It, it, the drumbeat of the organisation is warm, 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 hot. Warm, 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 hot. And the hot bit is the implementation. So I'm a big fan of democracy until we've agreed what we're going to do. And I rather like being in charge. Um, because that's when it's got to be enforced. That's where the organization really kicks into performance management. Performance management is not democracy. Innovation and the way that we do things is democracy. Performance management is holding ourselves to account first and our colleagues to account second. And the more that you can actually engage the public in that, the better. And as far as I'm concerned, leaders, what they do is they do the red herring performance management, where they say, look at this shiny thing I've got. You know, I've got this shiny thing here. I've got a shiny Nancy, hasn't she done really well? And that's what they do in performance management to throw you off the scent. And then you say, no, no, I don't just want one Nancy, I want four. Sorry, fellas. Um, you heard it here first. Um, so that's what you want. You've got to insist on everything being meticulous. Okay. Um, another creative idea is we have a lot of problems uh, in England with uh, alcohol-related violence. We call it the nighttime economy. It is a big problem for every police force around the country. And in some of the areas in Durham, they have what they call the nanas or grandmas the street grandmas or the street nanas who come out and they actually, they are the guardians of that particular area. They come out, they're nice to the young people, the girls' heels at the end of the evening, if their feet are sore from the high heels, they give them sort of flip-flops, uh, they give them a cup of tea or a cup of coffee and they get on the bus with them when they're going home in the evening, which means actually in some of these particular towns, the police now don't even attend. They don't the, need to. The one thing the street nanas refuse to do, though, is hand out condoms. They <laughs> don't approve of extramarital <laughs> sex. So, but the, the cop who first got that idea, loads of organisations were said, oh, no, no, you can't go out there. It's dangerous. And we said, well, come on out there. And... The, the, the sense in Concert Town Centre now at night is just amazing because you've got all these little old ladies and men pottering around offering people um, flip-flops and cups and, of tea. And this is all voluntary. This is all voluntary. <coughs> and, and they pay for the flip-flops and the cups of teas themselves by running sort of coffee, coffee mornings and things like that. They are amazing people. Yeah, but they don't accept the free condoms. Anyway, so <laughs> the way that you, you've got to problem solve your organization. So the one thing that, recruitment, uh, I, I get involved in recruitment and when I arrived 10 years ago in the organization, this was assigned to, to junior staff. That's not to say that, that there's anything wrong with that, but every single member of staff that I recruit, if it's a police officer and they're gonna spend their, time, their life with us, that's a 1.7 million pound investment. If you were spending £1.7 million on something, would you go and have a look round first? That's exactly what we do. The staff survey. The staff survey is now offered to uh, Durham uh, University. Uh, Dr. Les Graham runs it. And as a result of that, we're now really forensically unpicking what is wrong in the organisation. So hindrance stressors are a huge thing in the organisation now. We've unpicked it, and now we're giving every individual in the organisation, what are your hindrance stressors? What are the things that wind you up? You will all know, because you all work for organisations. It's now your responsibility to work with your line manager and colleagues to fix it. Everybody's got a responsibility, not only in delivering problem-oriented policing out there in terms of our community outcomes, but also how you fix your own organisation. The, the other thing there, uh, elephant in the room, write your own software. All of these people who say you buy it from all the uh, software houses, forget it. It's rubbish. Uh, it's an urban myth, and you're wasting a fortune. Write your own software. I just recruit kids from the local university, and they're all geniuses. 
go to good university. Okay. Uh, the other thing that he does is he actually sort of brings in the academics. That's the thing about actually with Durham is their close link with the academic world, not just with Durham University and, a couple of minutes. and the student. I know you've left me two minutes to do all my bit, I noticed. Okay. Uh, but he brings in, <laughs> brings in the <coughs> academics uh, to help him, whether it's, you know, Nick Tilly, this guy, Dr. Andy Fisher, he's, he works with, uh, on something called mutual gains, which is the Lawrence Susskind stuff, but actually developing relationships with communities. What do they want? Often community priorities are very different to police priorities. You know, you please the community and they'll come on your side when you need them, when you want to do the rough stuff. Um, and also working with the recruits. Uh, training is a big part of what I do with, with the staff there. I've only ever worked with the middle managers and above, but I've just started to work with the recruits as well. Um, Mike does his own for everybody else in between. So there is that investment. Uh, here's one of the sessions that I ran for Mike. Mike does his masterclass. Uh, everyone in the organization, doesn't matter what role you play, has to have a pop masterclass at least once a year. And this was a refresher course from people from finance, from the media department, from police enforce, enforcement departments, etc. And uh, they have a two-hour masterclass on POP, and they have to have that refresher. It is compulsory. One of the things you'll notice on here to the right-hand side is that the other thing I'm big on in my training is I provide sweets and lollipops and prizes. Uh, he doesn't do that, so they all got sweets uh, when they were there. I'm not going to go into there, but part of this, because everyone in this room knows this, but actually part of my training is to get officers and, um, and staff to understand what SARA is, because it is, a simple, it is a simple model, but it's actually quite complicated to use, so understanding how to use it. Making it simple, I thought I'd show you this example. This is one police force SARA model. Um, that is worse, if anyone knows Paul Ekblom, I don't know if he's in the room, but actually, that's even worse than a Paul Ekblom model. You do, not, you do not want that. I try to get them to see that the theories that people like Marcus have come up with is actually, they're, they're incredible tools, really useful tools for them to use. You know, the rational choice theory, which is about not only about what you do, but understand how it works, understand what you need to put into place. Uh, so we go through all this. Broken windows theory, understanding if they can get stuff when it's low level. And the problem analysis triangle. Every single police officer in the UK knows what a PAP triangle is, but they often don't know how to use it. And it is a brilliant tool, understanding routine activity theory. And we go through all that, but I do it in a very simplistic way with lots, usually use lots of pictures. This one here from Minority Report is when we talk about predictive policing. Actually, so much is based on repeat victimization. Where did things happen in the past? Let's have a look at the information that we've got at where it's happened in the past. Most police responses are very much the same ones. Police officers often want an easy response. They want something quick. They want something that they're familiar with, they've used before, you know. And so I often think that it's a bit like getting the same thumbed books out of a library. What I try to get them to do is to say, let's pick a new book. Let's get for Malcolm's book this time instead of reading someone else's book and try something a bit different because to try to think about actually what will work in the right context. I also talk about analysis. Generally, this is the sort of look I get from police officers when we talk about analysis. There is that fear in their eyes about what analysis, because you all make it very complicated. Somebody said earlier in the last session about actually the language, Stuart, it was you, the language from academics and the language of police officers is quite different. And you, you've got to find that way of understanding each other. And so I try to make it simple, and all I, we talk about are stories. How do you understand the story about how something has happened? And I usually talk about Jack and the Beanstalk, but uh, some of you may not know that. Hypothesis testing, we talk about that. You know, in the recording system from uh, Durham on their pop forms, there are three sections in there about hypothesis testing. Why do you think your problem is happening? We go through all that, but in an incredibly simplistic way. This is just from the TV program house, which is actually all they do for the whole TV program. We talk about questioning the problem. Anybody know who this guy is? Anyone know who he is? Shipman. He is called Dr. Harold Shipman. He actually is our biggest uh, serial killer in, um, in the UK. He murdered over 200 people, mainly elderly ladies. Um, and in fact, 
part of the formal report about, um, about Harold Shipman, how did he manage to get away over systematically, over years, systematically years of killing uh, elderly ladies is because he was a doctor and nobody questioned him. Nobody questioned him because he was a doctor. When you look at him, there were lots of triggers that should have actually said, ooh, something's not right about this man, let's have a look. More interestingly, he was my doctor. My ex-husband said what a lot of trouble it would have saved him if he'd continued to be my doctor. <laughs> Just very quickly, you know, Gloria, your engineering stuff, we talk about how things work, how, you know, understanding how things go together. We talk about things like on my training in uh, Walter White. For any of you that have not seen Breaking Bad, I can recommend it. It's fantastic. But Walter White turned from a very sort of, you know, very normal sort of man, probably didn't even have a parking ticket, to a very serious drugs manufacturer and dealer. So what are the opportunities that arose there to try to stop and, you know, prevent Walter from becoming this very serious offender? So that's the sort of thing we talk about when we're reducing opportunities. Thinking about more like a medical practitioner, and I've borrowed John Eck and Rana Samson's model in thinking about who has power to make things happen, who are those super controllers. And just all the time, I get them to try to think about being a little more creative. From Apollo 13, we watch a clip of the film on my training sessions, is to say, actually, you don't always have, you know, the resources to do things, but actually there are ways that you can make things work. So, sorry, I went over time. But just this and then finally, uh, the chap there who's next to me, and I'm sticking my finger up his nose, is David <laughs> Clark. He's, uh, he was a massive offender in our organisation. He's now, uh, uh, he would say, clean from drugs. Or, uh, I know people don't like clean. Clean from drugs. And he's now one of our drugs champions. And he's just a great asset for us in terms of reducing uh, the reoffending of other people. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I did forget to say, actually, when I give prizes, I also give books. Several years ago, Gloria recommended this book to me, and it's about how things, recognizing failure, because we celebrate success all the time, but what we don't do is actually look enough at failure. And so, therefore, this, if anyone's not read this black box thinking it's a great book, and I will give this to someone at the end, I haven't decided yet who. Okay. <laughs> You shouldn't have left it here. Sorry. <laughs> okay, thank you, Sylvia, Mike. Uh, okay, our last presentation here will be uh, jointly presented by a colleague of mine from Arizona State University, Ed McGuire, and Professor Joe Coons from University of North Carolina, Charlotte, about their work in Trinidad and Tobago. Thanks, Mike. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here. Uh, sometimes it's no fun to go third, but this time it's going to be interesting to go third because I think uh, I can draw from both of these presentations and kind of wrap you into a new world and a, and a challenging world. I think the, the interesting thing about what I'm going to talk about today is implementation challenges in a place that's particularly challenged. So where as Shiny Nancy was down in Houston, a nice city in the United States, and it's a huge department, and they have lots of resources, and she uh, talked about the implementation challenges of uh, a convenience store project. And it's a big project, and lots of the lessons that she identified are present in many pop implementation uh, stories. Uh, Mike and Sylvia, and particularly Mike, I think, talked about some of the leadership challenges in an organization that are prominent and how you have to have sort of uh, leaders and advocates and champions and passion and things like that to properly implement problem-oriented policing. So envision walking into an environment where none of that is present. And I think that's where we're going to go when we go to Trinidad. Because when Ed and I uh, started this Trinidad project, we were entering an organization that was really different than many of the ones that we're used to, I think, in the United States, probably in the UK, and probably in other parts of the world. So I'm Joe Coons, and I'm from Charlotte, North Carolina. Ed is at Arizona State now. Ed was the principal investigator of this project, and this is a small piece of what was a really large 
multi-year, maybe crossing decades project. Uh, and uh, being from Charlotte, one of the things that interested me right off the bat, those of you who haven't been to Charlotte, Charlotte is a medium-sized city in the United States. We have about 1.4 million people. The police department in Charlotte is uh, sophisticated and competent, and they have about 1,400 officers, somewhere in that range. In Trinidad, Trinidad is a country, it's a two island country, show of hands of, for folks who know where Trinidad is. All right, so at least some of you, I was geographically challenged and I'll show you where it was. I didn't know where it was, but the number of citizens in Trinidad is roughly the same as the number in Charlotte, 1.4 million. But Trinidad had 7,000 officers, so they had a, a much larger police force to begin. Um, what they didn't necessarily have and what I think we were trying to introduce was problem-oriented policing. And we, we couldn't do it organizationally all at once because when you have 7,000 officers, that's going to be difficult. So what we ended up doing was picking a small community and focusing on that particular community. And let me kind of walk you through some of this. So uh, this is a, a project in Trinidad and Tobago. And if you go down the Caribbean islands and get to the very south and just off the tip of Venezuela, you have Trinidad and Tobago. And Trinidad and Tobago is a two island developing nation and a developing nation infrastructurally, educationally, and in, in terms of policing is very different than what you might find in other parts of the world. Um, Trinidad is the, the industrial part of the country, I think. Tobago is where many people go for vacation. We actually ended up doing work in both parts of the country, but most of our work was actually in the community of Gonzales. Gonzales was located in Port of Spain. Port of Spain is the capital of Trinidad and Tobago. It is the most densely populated part of Trinidad and Tobago. It was, um, it was a busy, vibrant city within a, uh, a developing nation. And by that, I mean there were, there were things about it that looked current and developed and modern, there were parts of it that looked uh, challenged and infrastructurally challenged. And the, the community of Gonzales particularly was a challenged community. Uh, I remember working in a couple different communities <coughs> in Trinidad. One was a West End and one was Gonzales. And I started looking at the crime rates in those particular neighborhoods. And many of you have worked in challenged neighborhoods, so you're familiar with this. This is a different level of challenge in some ways because Gonzales was a crime-challenged neighborhood, but it was also a neighborhood filled with citizens who didn't trust police at all, filled with uh, houses that sometimes didn't have water and didn't have electricity and didn't have basic fundamental um, uh, ingredients to sustain life. So, so lots of the things that we had to wrestle with in Trinidad and Tobago went well beyond crime and violence and, and drugs and gangs and it really uh, got into problems that were inherent in day-to-day -day living for the people in this particular neighborhood. Gonzales, however, had a grassroots community development mo uh, movement that was kind of spearheaded by a local um, clergy member and a, and a church, a religious organization, and so we thought there was a great opportunity to implement and start problem-oriented policing in this particular environment because some of the citizenry was already sort of invested in growing uh, and getting better and improving. So uh, we decided to implement a pilot project, a uh, community-oriented policing project. We were going to engage faith-based organizations. We we're going to engage the community. We had a series of goals. And at the, at the time, fortunately, we had a, an adjacent neighborhood uh, that we were going to use as a comparison neighborhood. So as we implemented problem-oriented policing, in the, in, the, in the target neighbor, Gonzales, we simultaneously were gonna be uh, interviewing residents in Belmont, which is an adjacent neighborhood. And so we had an opportunity to develop a little bit of a quasi-experimental design to give us a chance to see if implementation of POP really was gonna matter in Gonzales. So uh, just to give you a sense, houses uh, in upper and lower Gonzales. Gonzales itself was in a very hilly terrain it's pretty hot in Trinidad and Tobago. It's tropical. Uh, the housing infrastructure w was not good. Um, I remember thinking, you know, the, the, the nice houses are on the left and the less the nice houses are on the right. And the less the nice houses were, were by many standards, not really good living environments. It was sort of 
boards stuck together, um, uh, that uh, metal roofs, pipes above ground with heating and electricity and things like that. So it's it's a pretty challenging environment. Um, one of the things that, that sort of struck me as Ed and I started to walk through the neighborhood was uh, the residents seemed in some ways content, but uh, as we got into the POP process and I asked the officers that I worked with and trained to go out and talk to the neighbors, it turns out there are lots of things that the neighbors, that the, the, the citizens were not happy with and wanted to communicate to the police department and the, and the police department probably would not have really been receptive to that had we not, had Ed and I actually not kind of encouraged them, go door to door, go talk to people, go find out what the problems are and let's, let's figure out some solutions that'll make the people there uh, a little bit better off. So uh, we did some training and about this time, Mike actually had contacted me independently of the Trinidad project and asked me to put together a pop curriculum for the, for the pop center website. It was fun to do and interesting. I, drew lots of information from the Pop Center website and from many of the documents that existed there, stuff that you guys have worked on over the years. And I put together a curriculum. And, and Ed and I started to train. If you look closely, since Mike and Sylvia put their pictures up there, we decided we better have ours there. Ed's over there on the left, and I'm over here on the right. We look a little, a little different now. Uh, that was a while ago. So what we did, though, was we used this curriculum. I literally finished the curriculum, and boom, I was going to use it in Trinidad and Tobago. And I was going to use it with a group of officers that knew zero about problem-oriented policing, that knew zero about uh, Sarah modeling, that had maybe zero analytical capability. So I'm sort of starting brand new, trying to curriculum out in an environment that's going to be pretty difficult, and we'll see how it goes. So I went through the process, and it turned out pretty good. I think there were some uh, high points, some low points. I remember talking to Julie about this. In Trinidad, sometimes when you have a class, they show up, and sometimes they don't. Or sometimes they come halfway through, and sometimes they leave for lunch and never come back. And it was, you know, I'm used to teaching high, uh, you know, uh, students, and students are reasonably cooperative. Officers were less so in Trinidad and Tobago. They, they were about half there. So I had to kind of figure out ways to encourage and, 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 you know, one of your points was you want to have passion, right? You want to have officers that are passionate about, I didn't have that. I had minimal levels of passion in some, but I had really good passionate officers uh, here and there. So I kind of struggled through this training process, but part of what I had to do was help them start thinking about what the community needs, not what they think the community needs. So I asked them, as is part of the scanning phase, tell me what the problems are in Gonzales, because they were going to be assigned to Gonzales. Tell me what the, what the issues are. And they rattled off the answers, drugs, gangs, uh, alcohol, you know, alcohol in public, things like that. And then I said, I want you to walk door to door, and I want you to talk to citizens. And I really I had to uh, cajole them into doing this. It was not, they didn't want to do it. I sort of, you know, we're going to do this. They went door to door and asked the citizens, what are the problems in the neighborhood? And as you might suspect, what the citizens said was not what the officers said. There was a real disconnect. So lesson one for them and for me was you got to go talk to the people in the community to find out what bothers them, not act on what you think as an officer is bothering you. So I forced them to go door to door. We ran around and uh, part of what we had them do within the context of this door to door was we started to think about what kind of pop projects we wanted to develop and implement. And ended up kind of focusing our attention. <coughs> we, we, first of all, by the way, we had a mobile unit. The, I told you it was hilly and it was hot, and so just getting the officers into the community was difficult. So we got a mobile unit and put the mobile unit in the community and they worked out of that. That kind of helped in terms of uh, proximity to the people. But we ended up focusing their attention on three primary pop projects, and this project then will sort of assess the outcomes associated with the implementation of those three projects. One on trash and graffiti removal, one on abandoned car removal, and one on street light improvement. And I'll just touch on two things real quick and I'll turn it over to Ed to sort of see, share the results. Uh, removing cars, abandoned cars from a neighborhood is seemingly not difficult, but it was more difficult than we expected. 
Uh, and by that, I mean we had to find the car's owner, and we had to find whether or not they wanted the car, and we had to find whether or not uh, who actually in the city could remove the car, and what the process was for removing the car, and uh, how long it took to get that process underway, and how much notification, and so on. So the beginning stages of trying to just remove abandoned cars, and when I say abandoned cars, these were not these were not functional cars. They were never going to be functional. These were abandoned, rusted husks of vehicles that any of us would look at and say, "That's <laughs> get that out of here, right? In addition, they were hiding places for drugs. So lots of times these abandoned cars were, were stash points for, for drug dealers. So we had a vested interest, crime-related vested, vested interest in getting them out. But that abandoned car removal project, if I had my druthers, it would have taken two weeks in Trinidad and Tobago, it probably took eight months. But we finally had a day where we had a bunch of wreckers that came through and just basically lifted out 20 or 30 over the course of the project, abandoned cars. The other one was the trash removal. Trash was prominent in this area. Piles, uh, literally dump truck fulls. Uh, th on this particular day with the picture, we had six dump trucks of trash that was hauled out of the, uh, the community. And so it was a, it was a pretty uh, physically disordered environment. And part of actually what we looked at in terms of outcome measures was whether or not physical disorder uh, changed. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ed. Ed's gonna walk you through some of the evaluation results. Thank you, Joe. Okay. Did we do that one yet? Did we no. go in the right direction? That's right. All right implementation challenges. We invited the leadership of the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service up to Washington, D.C., where I lived at the time. We did this because we figured out in the course of the project that whenever we wanted to capture their attention, we had to get them out of the country, <laughs> get them away from their phones. And so we, um, we had a meeting with these folks, and the Gonzalez Project at the time was in uh, an utter state of implementation failure. And so we told the deputy commissioner and a couple of the assistant commissioners that we think it's time to abandon the project. We just can't take it anymore. And, uh, and, and that conversation actually turned out to be really useful um, because it turned out that uh, these folks weren't fully aware, even though we talked to them on a pretty regular basis, of how bad things had gotten. So the mobile unit that Joe was talking about, they would give it to us, they would take it away, give it to us, take it away. And it was just constantly sort of back and forth of the whole project just sort of falling apart and feeling like we're clinging onto it and losing it. And, and so that actually breathed some new life into the project and, and, uh, and helped us out in terms of implementation because we finally had a, we had lots of lower level program champions, but we didn't have those at the executive level. And so that conversation in Washington DC turned out to be pretty useful and actually gave us something to eventually Evaluate, which is what I'm presenting today. Um, and so we were interested in trying to figure out, um, there were several outcomes, but the ones we'll talk about today were whether the implementation of this community policing slash POP project reduced fear of crime, uh, social disorder, and physical disorder. So we ended up doing three waves of surveys in Gonzales and in a neighboring community that was very similar. This is a, these three waves were done annually in 2006, 2007, 2008. Each survey involved 300 residents of each community and measured a variety of phenomena, including the outcomes that I'll talk about today, which were perceptions of crime and disorder, fear of crime. And so there's this ongoing debate in the literature about how to, about what disorder is, what it means, um, and also how to measure it. Uh, an interesting anecdote uh, from, from our efforts to try to figure out what disorder meant to these folks, because a lot of the disorder literature comes out of um, the cities, large cities in developed countries. And so we were interested in knowing sort of what did they view as disorderly. We showed a variety of, of video clips from different communities uh, in Trinidad to these focus groups of residents. And um, in the middle of one of these focus groups, we're showing a video and uh, a resident jumps up and yells, foul. I'm a, 
American, I'm a baseball fan, so to me the foul means the ball went off to the wrong side of the foul pole. Um, actually, they were using the word, the word foul, F-O-W-L, uh, and what they were referring to is in the video that, that we were showing, there were chickens running uh, in the street, and to them, this was disorderly. Um, and so they had, a, they had a real problem. As soon as that, that was sort of for them, you know, one clear sign of disorder. We had to work our way through all of these various kinds of conceptual issues on the meaning of physical and social disorder. We've published some papers on that uh, over the last couple of years with our, our findings. Um, and so we have these various types of, of measures of physical and social disorder. Uh, one of the focus, the focus group with the foul things came sort of later in the project, and so we only have it for, uh, for our later waves, not for our earlier waves. But a lot of the standard measures of physical and social disorder were also quite meaningful to the residents of Trinidad, and we included those. We also measured uh, fear and perceived safety, drawing on the literature on fear of crime. These, we look at these as two different concepts, although they tend to be pretty highly correlated. Um, so looked at these outcomes as well. We did a standard difference in differences design. I won't get into the ugly details of all of that, uh, but just looking at uh, change over time uh, in the uh, comparison and in the treatment communities. And you can see just visually some of the Results here, this is perceived social disorder, wave one to wave three. Um, and so uh, you see uh, some initial drops and then things get a little uh, sort of more confusing between wave two and wave three. Um, so a moderate reduction in perceived social disorder from wave one to wave two uh, that we think had to do a lot with the officers that Joe had out in the community going around knocking on doors and so forth. <laughs> Um, and no real effect on perceived disorder from wave two to wave three, which is where those problem-solving projects were happening, so it was a little bit, uh, little bit challenging to interpret, and particularly challenging because we had these implementation issues that we were sort of struggling and trying to hold the project together. This is perceived physical disorder, um, and I won't get into all of the details, but we had some kind of curious results around physical disorder. Um, and we see some evidence, uh, you, you see this occasionally in the literature, but we saw some evidence around uh, we're hauling uh, abandoned vehicles out of the community, hauling trash out of the community, and in some ways it's almost like it drew attention to those issues and raised it in the consciousness of the residents. And our survey results on those particular items specifically suggest kind of a, almost a backfire effect of the, of the intervention. Uh, here's fear of crime, um, where we don't see, uh, from wave one to wave three, where we don't see um, dramatic differences between the two. Um, and, um, and then we have, oh, we're missing one, okay. But anyway, so we have um, community policing programs with a POP approach that can help to reduce perceived physical and social disorder um, and reduce fear and, uh, and, and perceptions of safety, our results around fear and perceptions of safety are very um, subtle, um, and uh, our, our papers on this topic uh, go through those results. But I think the one sort of major takeaway from this project for us is implementation issues uh, were dominant in every aspect of the project. We um, are writing a book from the project now, and the book is largely about implementation, not about outcomes, because it turns out to be the entire story. Um, a constant process of attempting to hold a project together while feeling like it's slipping out of your hands. Um, you have program champions who emerge and then disappear. You have other program champions who pop up and disappear. You have movement within the organization over time as people retire, as people, they have these long vacations that they take in the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service for like a year or two. It's a strange phenomenon in their personnel system. So you have this constant movement of people. One of the most fascinating sort of takeaways for me was the, um, I was at a police commissioner's meeting with the police commissioner from Trinidad. We were in uh, Barbados at the time, and we had some representatives from the Motorola Corporation who stood up uh, and announced a community policing award competition. So I leaned over and whispered into the ear of the police commissioner because I thought it would get us uh, a, little bit of, uh, a little bit more help than we had been getting. 
this project that we're doing in Gonzales is perfect for this award. And so some of the most robust implementation activity that we saw happened in the six months leading up to the due date for the application of that award. And they won, which turned out to be a really big deal for these folks. The community was so proud. And immediately after receiving that award, we didn't see that mobile unit again for months. And so that's what the book is ultimately about. Um, with covering sort of outcomes and so forth, the standard kinds of evaluation design. But what the book is really about is attempting to hold a project together in a fragile environment, um, a, a, a place where innovation at the time was sort of a particularly kind of a new idea, and um, what lessons we can derive from that as we seek to implement these interventions in similar communities uh, around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Ed, uh, at this time, I'd invite any questions, comments. Marcus, please, if you wait for the microphone. I, I have a, um, a kind of a knee-jerk, I, I want to ask Dr. Uh, Dr. Levan this. Uh, I have a knee-jerk reaction against the 10-12 the point program. And I, I do believe you had a, an, an effect and that it was important and they could have sustained it. But my real question is, it may be that one or two of the bullets were the key and that, if, that a two-point program might have been easier to sustain or easier to nudge them later if they failed to sustain it. I what do you think? Yeah, that's a really good point. I had the same thought. It was a long and demanding list um, and quite burdensome both on the part of the, the retail stores and on law enforcement to ensure that uh, stores were complying with that list. And some of them were you know, pretty expensive. I mean, demanding that all stores install um, those emergency buttons at the counter, um, public surveillance cameras. Um, so I think, yeah, they, they could have winnowed that down and been a little bit more strategic and more tailored to the I specific think, nature of the crime problem. I think getting the ads off the window alone may be the number one thing. And also, it's easier to go back and see that, 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 um, that ha they had stopped doing that and to complain to them. And so it, it my, uh, the, I guess the, 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 my, my basic suggestion is to try to find simple implementations that are sustainable. Mm -hmm. Other questions, comments? Stuart. Uh, my question to Mike and Sylvia. So, perk up. Yeah. Uh, so I got from uh, the impression of of the uh, presentation that problem orientation went much wider than just problem solving. And I was wondering how in the, uh, the uh, refresher that, that your staff get every year, it's about seeing that wider picture rather than just learning the mechanics of problem solving. Yeah, I invite people to bring their own problems, the sort of problems that they're facing that day, and I particularly encourage them to bring problems about those hindrance stresses that they find in their own organization. But I also offer it to partner agencies as well. So I like doing um, uh, multi-agency problem solving days where we look at themes or I invite people to bring specific issues, then we work on those. I think the, the critical issue though, uh, Stuart, is not the fact of the knowledge I give them or, or the knowledge I get back or, <clears throat> the two hours themselves. It, it, what's really important is that they see it valued by the leadership. I think far too few leaders get involved in the, their, their own staff development. They, they see it as something that, that's not there. They've got an HR department or a training department or a learning facility. Um, and I think all leaders should be gurus, should be teachers and you should teach what you value. And, you, and if you teach it, you understand it. Sylvia, did you want to comment? I don't, I don't, is it on? If you just speak into it. You know, no, I'm, 
is that, oh, it is on. Uh, one of the things that, that for me is, um, is to make it personal. Um, so any training that is generic can be a bit bland <coughs> if you're not careful. And so it's actually, uh, you know, everyone that, that I work with, they have to work on their own problem. They bring their own, not personal problems, can't solve them, uh, but their own sort of work problems with them. And we work through that through throughout any of the sessions, whether it's a two hour sort of class or whether it's a it's a full day or a two day. -er. You know, the two day are great because you can really concentrate and work on someone's particular personal problem that, that is, you know, is a demand problem to them, you know, over a period of time. So it's actually there getting their involvement, getting their interest. And as Mike says, it is about, is about the passion. And that's always one advantage of bringing in the experts because the experts have got more passion about training, if you believe in something. I always feel sorry for police trainers because police trainers have to have a knowledge of everything from the law to pop to vulnerability to antisocial behavior. So they have to read it up and then regurgitate it. And it can become for police officers and for staff and for partners, it can become a little boring or bland for them, more than boring. And, and so therefore, that's the one advantage with someone who believes in it is in a passionate uh, and has that expertise. Can I just, come, uh, just two things there? Number one, I don't <laughs> like uh, those bland police trainers, so we don't, ha we, they are at an absolute minimum. It's our experts, it's our passionate people that train, so it's practitioners who train other practitioners. And the other thing is that when I do my master classes and I think, oop, this is a bit of a problem, I bring her in. So, um, so we had a pretty good problem with middle ranking officers, inspectors, chief inspectors, who felt it was beneath them. So uh, they all, all got wheeled in and had two days of Sylvia's wisdom. Oh yes. <laughs> in fact, in fact, one and a half days to straighten them out. The other half a day was she had fun. Uh, Ron, and then if you'll hand it to Deborah after. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, three very interesting presentations, um, and I had lots of thoughts as I was listening to it all, but I'll confine myself to a couple of points. Um, first of all, um, I, I'm really looking forward to reading your book on Trinidad because uh, I constantly nowadays say to myself and to everyone else who, anyone else who will listen, is that the real crime problems are in developing countries and we need to export or we need to take an interest and try to figure out how to help, uh, how to help most effectively uh, the developing countries deal with their serious problems. So I, 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 that's a general point. Um, I wanted to just, uh, uh, in the remaining time to me, mention something to Nancy that she's very well aware of, but I'm just reinforcing the point, really. And that was uh, the uh, point you made about the anecdotal evidence about um, displacement. Well, we've had lots and lots of uh, research studies looking at anecdotal evidence of displacement, and mostly it doesn't stack up mm -hmm. um, because the opportunity structures are completely different. Uh, in a convenience store, I mean, I'm not fully aware of, of everything about the Houston convenience stores, but I don't know how, how many hours they work and all that sort of thing, compared with the retail uh, uh, stores that the, the displacement is supposed to have gone to. I doubt very much that if one could uh, identify the, the two sets of factors, the opportunity structure for both, uh, sets, uh, the convenience stores and the retail stores, that you would find enough um, congruence to suggest there was any real displacement. But that's just a general point. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think that's quite right. I, I was working off of the case study write-up for the Goldstein Awards submission as my source document for all of this, so I've not really delved into any of the details behind what was stated in that document. Um, they did take care to say it was anecdotal, but your point is very well made. Deborah, I just wanted to comment. I was fortunate to have three personnel from 
Durham Constabulary visit North Carolina last week to see policing there. So they obviously have drunk the Mike Barton Kool-Aid, as I saw evidence in place there. But the American police officers were amazed when they found out how many of your 2,500 personnel are civilians and not sworn police officers. I believe it's about 50-50, if I recall. And it, it knocked their socks off, and they're like, oh, yeah, of course you can do primary police if you have that much civilian support. So I wondered about your reaction to that. Is it a, it's much higher, obviously, than most of the American police agencies by far. Yeah, my answer to that is it, it's always easy, isn't it? Um, you know, I, I don't want to sound cynical, but um, people tell me that it's very easy in Durham because we're a small police force. Um, people tell us that it's easy because Durham's a sleepy place in the northeast of England. Um, if it's so easy, why aren't all small police forces doing it? If it's so easy, why aren't all UK police forces doing it? Because they've got the same proportion of support staff. You know, we're in the Rust Belt. Durham County, which I police, um, is the poorest county in the country. Cornwall and Durham are the two poorest counties, but Cornwall has a bigger black economy because it's got tourism. And deprivation and crime go hand in glove. So there's loads of factors uh, that mean it's easy. There's loads of factors that mean it's hard. And I think anybody who holds on to a one reason to justify why they can't do it will never do it because they don't care. Uh, they don't even know who Herman Goldstein is. And even if you told them, they wouldn't do it. I, I just think people like, I mean, um, I, I just get dreadfully depressed when people come out with facile uh, statements like that. Problem-oriented policing, driving organizations so that everybody cares is a 24-7 occupation. It, you've got to breathe it. And if you don't breathe it, it doesn't happen. Thank you. If you're going to get cynical on us here, Mike, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. <coughs> Invite you to leave. Uh, uh, Deborah, would you tell the audience where, by chance, did the Durham police visit in North Carolina? The Durham, North Carolina Police Department, <laughs> which has one of the highest violent crime rates in the U.S. and tons of gun crime. But they had a good exchange. It, it really went back and forth quite well. And the idea of sending them was, number one, to be exposed to you. And thank you for that. And, and they loved it, and particularly your facilitation. But I wanted to expose them to difference. If you don't expand the minds of the people who work for you, you can't possibly expect them to think and understand. And that, that was the proof in the pudding. You sent three personnel to the United States for a mm. week, and our officers were saying, they, you, they did what? You know... They were surprised that you would send someone so far away to make observations of them. So I think it was an indication of what you're talking about today. Uh, Andrew, you're in the second row. Thank you. Uh, two, two questions, one first to Nancy and then to Ed and Joe. This phenomenon that's been shown now in a couple presentations where you have the cliff drop and then you go back up the cliff, has anybody looked into whether it's the same offenders involved? Um, who's, who's engaged in it? Because I think there's kind of two hypotheses in my mind. Either the same offenders are coming back and taking advantage of it when sort of the policing goes away, and or at the base of it all is the place managers who have sort of been neglected. They get in line while they need to, and then mm -hmm. they're back to their old ways. Yeah. So that's my question to Nancy and then yeah. to Ed and Joe. Um, having worked a lot in Africa and Asia and trying to implement POP in different situations down there, one of the hardest issues I have is getting the correct training material. Um, I'm also working not with urban police but with wildlife officers. But did you have to rewrite some of the training materials to fit the Trinidad-Tobago situation or were you able, because POP Center is a great resource, it just sometimes doesn't translate that easily to officers in those situations. So, thank you. Nancy? Sure. Um, that's a really good question. I don't know whether it was the same offenders or, or different people entirely. It's, and I don't know how easy it would be to discern that based on the, the data that they have. Um, in terms of whether it's the same business culprits or not, 
I sense probably it's different um, uh, stores because a lot of the stores fell in line, uh, complied very quickly, and then it was that, that small percentage, right? Um, that some of them may have complied and, and the nature of the compliance was, you know, considerable. I suppose they could have started putting signs back up on the windows, but there's also always new stores um, closing and then opening. And so I think a lot of the sustain sustainability was around the new stores that were emerging and not continuing to um, persuade them and educate them on what they needed to do. Joe, Ed? Yeah, so uh, with respect to the training curriculum, I, I mentioned that I had put together the POP curriculum around the same time. And I, so I had this nice set of 14 modules that I had intended to use for the first time in Trinidad and Tobago. I threw five of them out immediately and I started to adjust a bunch of different ones. And, you know, over the course of time, I've used that curriculum or parts of it with Raleigh police officers in Raleigh, North Carolina, Charlotte lieutenants in Charlotte, North Carolina, students at the university. And I find I adapt it every single time to the audience that's in front of me sometimes more focus on analytical aspects of, of, prop, of pop. And then with respect to sort of the, the, the semantical dialogue, dialect kinds of things, we had to make some minor adjustments, but Caribbean, uh, I'm sorry, Trinidadians were predominantly English spe speaking, so we were pretty good there. I do remember the first time I visited, and I'm sure you experienced it as well, I had real difficulty hearing and understanding what they were saying. I assumed they had the same concern with me. So I found I adjusted my language and I adjusted my pace and I adjusted the documents to make it more accommodating. And sort of one last point, Trinidadians had an average literacy that would be comparable to our eighth grade in the United States. So I had to kind of be mindful, I couldn't go full bore, I had to kind of, you know, do Maybe. pieces at a time, you know, do a chunk and have them think about it, and do a chunk and have them think about it. But there was quite a bit of adjustment and, com and accommodation as I went through the process. I don't know. Yeah, and the only thing I'll add is uh, something that we did that earned us a lot of credibility uh, in being able to carry out the training was we spent a lot of time on the ground. Um, there, were, uh, there were times where I was up all night uh, doing ride-alongs with the officers, and then I had to train all day the next day and would try to sort of sneak in some sleep before I would be out all night with the officers again. Um, and so uh, every member of our team did this, and it earned us a lot of credibility. We now do this everywhere we go for the most part, particularly in these environments where just our basic assumptions about how policing, just how the job of policing is carried out, um, as, as at least in our case as Americans, were just so dramatically wrong, um, so just so different from, from, um, from how policing is really carried out in these very challenging environments, that actually when we would go out and we would spend time on the ground with the officers, a, it would help build relationships and solidify, I guess a lot of people, a lot of trainers over the years had come and gone. Um, and so the fact that we would go out and sacrifice sleep and so forth to, to spend time on the ground with them, it convinced them of our commitment and that we weren't just sort of fly-by-nighters. Um, but the other thing it did is it just taught us about their world and enabled us to adapt our training so that it would be more suitable um, for, for for their reality. It's a reminder that there, this translating problem-oriented policing it has many different levels to it. And there's a literal translation of the, of the information, which we is relatively easy, although not, not simple. Uh, but then there's the cultural. And the cultural translation is very difficult for anybody from the outside to do. It has to be done from inside. Ed and I and some of our colleagues at ASU were at the beginning of doing some work with, in both Honduras, where there's need for both the literal and the cultural, as well as within our own state in uh, the Navajo, uh, Navajo Nation, which cuts across several states. And that's a whole cultural translation that will be required of us. Marcus. I, I think, uh, Ed and Joe, that you, you may be undercrediting yourselves for the, the good you did because removing the cars and the trash is a major thing. And what, if you also triggered complaining, 
and then that uh, uh, that produces a, a, a small correlation in a success rate. You're measuring, in effect, complaining is actually a good thing. You took people who were taking for granted uh, being in a terrible situation, and now they're not. So in a sense, you produce two good things, and they, cro they canceled each other out in the measurement and made it look like you weren't effective. Can so we, ask, the, the, can we the, have him write the foreword to the oh, book? You're, you're, on, you're on task for writing the foreword to the book. Thank you. So what, the, the question is, can you, can you find in your questionnaire an item or some piece of it which more closely identifies their um, recognizing despite the complaining or perhaps controlling for the complaining, find a way to get at um, an, uh, some sense of appreciation. Uh, and even if you can't, it's still a good thing for people who are in a hopeless situation to discover some hope. That's a great point, thank you. And I think we can, um, we had a qualitative research team who did uh, interviews and focus groups and these kinds of things. And I don't think we have quantitative measures that would get us there, but certainly very rich kinds of anecdotes and, and, and uh, just people talking about their lived experiences in these communities as they went through these projects that I think would help us be able to, to get at that. Thank you. And I just, oh. Can I just say one thing to, to Marcus that, uh, Many, several years ago, I was delivering some, some training, or, or lectures actually, to a senior international strategic leadership program. So they were from all sorts of con different countries. And we were working, and we, one of the things we were doing was to use your problem analysis triangle, to use it as a tool, and I was trying to show them how to use this. And I went around each group and said, come up with a problem that you've got that's your biggest problem in your, in your country or in your area. And we had, you know, the theft of cars, and we had store crime, and we had other things. And it came to Trinidad and Tobago, and their problem was kidnapping. Their biggest problem was kidnapping. And I thought, oh my God, I'm used to doing burglaries with this or whatever. I've never dealt with this before. And it, can I just say, it worked for them beautifully. Questioning the problem from all sides made them think differently about the problem. So. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was a useful tool that they had in Trinidad and Tobago. Okay, so as not to make you late for lunch, uh, join me in thanking the panelists.